Hi, uh, today what we're going to do is be wrapping up the uh, LaRoe book. So today's class will be kind of concluding the book in terms of kind of revisiting some ideas, uh, looking at some constant themes throughout the book uh, in a little bit of a different way. And then what we'll do is uh, focus on the variable of race and how that can or maybe cannot uh, influence how a parent parents. So we'll kind of wrap up the book today and then kind of talk about race um, similar to what you know I'm asking you to do in the last part of your report. So we'll visit that today. So do you know have a brief recap. Basically what we've been doing is going through the book and in reference to the thesis, uh, arguing that different uh, class backgrounds uh, produce different parenting styles. So if you're from you know, upper and middle classes, you typically parent in you know, this way, the CC way. You're from more uh, working class, lower class um, positions, you typically parent uh, differently. And these differences of parenting are not simply by uh, choice, but they're grounded in uh, different uh, class-based resources, such as money, uh, time, uh, what is kind of normal for your lifestyle, uh, education levels, so on and so on. So again, it's class kind of driving the parenting ways, and then these parenting ways have different consequences uh, for the kids. And the CC kids start to develop, at a very young age, they start to develop these institutional skills that are very compatible with what uh, schools ask you, what work ask you. And so when you have those skills, and you know what to do, uh, you know, when it's being asked of you to do, uh, you know, you can thrive in those situations. The NG kids, on the other hand, are getting more survival skills. You know, these skills are not as compatible, you know, at school, uh, at work. And so they're not helping those students kind of thrive in those environments. They feel more of a sense of being constrained. You know, I just want to get through, I just want to survive. Yeah, but those survival skills are very valuable when it comes to you know, navigating daily life in lower class and working class environments. So, you know, LaRoe recognizes, you know, kind of the positive and negatives when it comes to the parenting and the consequences of the parenting for the kids. But kind of one negative is that although the survival skills are very useful when it comes to navigating the working and lower class life, uh, those survival skills are kind of holding those kids back. Um, they have to kind of do more, uh, starting you know from, you know, uh, kind of lower position from the get go to keep up with the middle and upper class kids in school and in work environments. Thus, there's the class reproduction. You know, if the skills that are very valuable are monopolized by the you know upper or middle class kids then kind of by default, the NG kids are gonna be at a disadvantage. And as you can see how the class reproduction uh, will operate as a result. You would uh, succeed in school, succeed in work, thus you're part of the middle and upper classes. When you're experiencing lower levels of success, it'll be more pushed into, you know, the kind of working in a lower class job environment. So I like the way Laro kind of finishes her book. So this is what I meant by kind of revisiting some ideas, but doing it a little bit differently. So here, you know, she talks about you know, two different school graduations. And basically, you know, I like to think that they're operating metaphorically in the sense that kind of the CC graduation is full of uh, hope. Uh, it's full of entitlement, you know, just kind of the general uh, feeling in the room, uh, the general kind of mood of everybody there, uh, the speakers and what they're kind of talking about, uh, the language they use. And compared to the uh, NG uh, graduation, there's more of a sense of constraint, uh, more a sense of kind of struggle. So for example, you know, the graduation speech, you know, for the CC kids, you know, the world is yours, you know, you're gonna go out and conquer it and do whatever you want with your lives, you know, your whole lives are ahead of you. Uh, compared to the NG graduation speech where, you know, the world is tough, you know, you're going to be up against it a lot. You're going to go and find a lot of barriers in life, but you have to keep on fighting, you know, you have to get through it. So, you know, here you have kind of the world is yours to do whatever you want. And here you have kind of the weight of the world is on top of you. And you're just going to have to do your best to survive. 
So I found you know, that interesting because it really parallels a lot of these arguments where you know, the NG kids start to feel constrained. You know, it's kind of me against the world. I just want to get through. I just want to survive. And the, the entitlement she gets and the CC ones, you know, the world is mine. I can do whatever I want to do. Uh, kind of the hope uh, versus kind of the struggle. And so that's basically you know, how we can think about the graduation and how it ties into those lar larger themes that we unpack throughout the book. So now she kind of comes back and revisited in. Uh, what you read in the first two chapters, kind of the focus on class, you know, how class is that driving force in terms of the parenting, how class uh, is that driving force in terms of, you know, the NG kids collecting certain skills, the CC kids uh, collecting other skills. And so, you know, she kind of puts forth this question, you know, do we live in a classless society? And so on the one hand, you know, LaRoe is going to argue, no, you know, class is definitely a big part of our society and how people live and uh, you know, how they kind of end up in one position or another position uh, throughout their life course. Uh, you know, like I say at the bottom of the slide here, you know, LaRoe hopes to reveal to her readers some of the both kind of more visible ways of recognizing class matters, you know, having the money to you know, enroll your kid in these activities to hire tutors uh, or not having that money. It's pretty easy to kind of recognize, uh, but also sometimes the more invisible. Uh, mechanisms in play that contribute to class reproduction. You know, the acquiring these time management organization skills, you know, feeling comfortable uh, speaking, uh, being able to have these kind of longer conversations because you have more time to spend uh, with the parent. So again, some of this goes on, but we don't think about it because it's kind of invisible. It's not in front of us, so it's not on our mind. So, you know, LaRoe definitely argues that class matters and specifically it matters when it comes to parenting and that parenting uh, as a result can contribute to people staying in their same classes, you know, the working class or the upper class. But also, you know, she wants us to recognize that, you know, although this is her argument and although that may be, you know, in our sociology class, you know, we bring that to the forefront. Now, often, you know, we think we do live in a class of society. So, you know, more people than not like to think that one's life chances. So your ability to kind of make it uh, in life or your ability to maybe not make it in life. That's not, you know, don't give me the class background, the family background argument. You know, it's all about the individual. So, you know, typically we like to focus on life chances on one's personal aspirations. So, you know, if you want to achieve it, if you really want it enough, then you can get it. And by default, you know, we explain people who don't get it, who, you know, don't make it as people who didn't want it enough, people who didn't try enough. So again, we typically focus on the individual and we kind of ignore all the class-based resources that do factor in, but instead we focus on the individual. Um, do you have the talent, you know, uh, if you make it in life, it's because you have more talent than other people. Uh, again, by default, when you say that, you say that those who don't make it in life are not talented, or at least not as talented as those who do. And then, you know, the idea of kind of work, you know, you didn't make it in life because you didn't work hard enough. You know, you did make it in life by default because you did work hard enough. So, you know, we're not trying to say that, you know, work, talents, and aspirations don't play any role in this. Uh, but we are trying to say, you know, on top of that, you know, class-based resources matter as well. Again, kind of the NG kids from the get-go are kind of starting from behind and have a lot more kind of work to do to get to the same level as kind of the CC kids. So again, you know, I like to use myself as a personal example. You know, when I went to college, you know, I did, you know, well, you know, I did well in terms of my classes, my GPA, and you know, I was in the honors program and all that. So, you know, I can pat myself on the back and say, hey, you know, you did that. You did it all by yourself. You know, nobody took my uh, test for me. Nobody uh, wrote my papers. You know, I did all the work. And, um, you know, I had those aspirations to be a strong student. So I could explain my success, you know, as a college student on that personal level. But then there was other things going on that also contributed to that. Um, I didn't have to... Uh, work to pay my tuition and you know, my tuition was paid for me by my grandparents and so that was one factor that allowed me to have more free time to concentrate on my uh, studies more free time and to kind of focus on those papers on the exams um, 
you know, I grew up in a family that, uh, you know, two uh, teachers. And so, again, I was kind of socialized in a way to kind of, you know, learn what's important when it comes to uh, student success. You know, my mom was a kindergarten teacher. My dad uh, taught at the college level. So, you know, I get kind of these two different socializations in terms of, you know, you need to feel comfortable, you know, talking to adults. You need to have confidence, you know, around these authority figures. And so, you know, they kind of taught me these little uh, tricks of the trade. And, you know, so I could go on and on, but I could recognize that, yes, I had to do the work myself, nobody did it for me, but I also need to at least pay attention to kind of the advantages that I was provided kind of growing up in a you know, middle class, upper middle class family. And so that's what Laurel is basically saying, you know, we have to recognize, yes, the individual factors, but also the social factors that sometimes contributes to individuals doing one thing or doing something else. So now I'm going to turn our attention to the variable rates. So like we said, you know, she went into the research looking at both variables, uh, race and class, and she ultimately says that class matters more. You see, you know, African-American and white families basically parenting the same styles when they're sharing a class background. And so again, uh, that's showing us, that's showing the reader that, you know, class matters more than race because if race matter more, then they would be parenting differently, no matter if they shared a class background or not. And so here we can look at race as a variable or look at race as not being an influencing variable. So typically when you did see race kind of creep into the equation in terms of how a parent is parenting and how they think about their child and how they act with their child. And typically you didn't see this in the white families. You know, they never kind of saw, you know, their kids as being white. You know, so when their kids were getting in trouble at school, uh, you know, the kid did something wrong. You know, so like, for example, when I got in trouble at school, my mom didn't think that, oh, the teachers treated me differently because I'm white. You know, so basically, you know, sometimes you see that the white parents, you know, only see their kids as kids, not as white kids. And that differs often when you look at African-American parents. Uh, when they're parenting, it's not only I'm parenting my kid, I'm parenting my African-American kid. So it's another kind of variable into the equation of the parenting. So, you know, you saw you know, Alexander Williams, for example, you know, him coming from an upper class family, uh, his parents were still mindful about being, you know, an African-American kid. They wanted to expose him to, you know, these different cultures. So he just, you know, he's not only familiar with kind of a white dominant middle-class culture, but he's familiar to other cultures as well. And, you know, you see this in, you know, other chapters where, you think that you know my kid is getting you know followed around the mall you know by you know security and not because the kid is young and perhaps you know it's the young people that do the shoplifting but rather they're following my kid around because my kid is an african-american kid so you have to be mindful that potentially you know not always but there's potential for your kid to be treated differently based upon the kid's race where you really don't see that same type of potential with uh, white kids and white parents as a result aren't thinking about you know my kid being white and how that can maybe work against him in a given situation where the african-american parents you know does have to potentially think about the situation that you know maybe the teacher does you know, treat him differently uh, maybe the coach is treating her differently uh, based upon the race uh, more so based upon the kid uh, her himself and so we'll get into that more uh, later on in the semester when we get into uh, race as our uh, class subtopic and when we look at the uh, social institution of uh, families. So we'll get into that later a little bit further. So um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to go through that there. And we say this is a, a cross class um, a thing that African-American families experience. So, you know, the upper class African American families, the working lower class African American families, they all kind of share the same kind of plight of not only parenting a kid, but parenting an African American kid, what often, you know, kind of adds another layer on to that parenting experience. So we'll leave that there uh, for today. As always, if you have any questions about the book, uh, about the book report, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, otherwise, I'll be in touch with you.